everyone, and welcome to this evening's virtual book club. I'm Robert Newman, President and Director of the National Humanities Center, and your host for this evening's event. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that to participate in the discussion, you'll need to log into YouTube by clicking on the blue sign in button in the upper right hand corner of the page using your Gmail account. This evening is the fourth event in our ongoing virtual book club series, talking with scholars whose work explores the long history and complex dynamics of racial oppression in the United States. Our guest this evening is Kim Hall, Lucille Hook Chair of English and Professor of Africana Studies at Barnard College. Over the past three decades, Kim has established herself as one of this generation's most interesting and insightful scholars of Renaissance literature. Her first book, Things of Darkness, Economies of Race and Gender in Early Modern England, which employed a Black feminist approach to the interpretation of Renaissance literature, helped launch the field of early modern race studies. And her recent work on the roles of race, aesthetics, and gender in the Anglo-Caribbean sugar trade of the 17th century has outlined important paths for new scholarly work on the relationship between imperialism, slavery, sexual politics, and cultural production throughout the Atlantic world. Kim Hall is a past chair of the Shakespeare Division of the Modern Language Association and a former trustee of the Shakespeare Association of America. And she's received fellowships from the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the ACLS. Kim was also a fellow at the National Humanities Center in 2016-17, working on her current project, exploring how Shakespeare's Othello has shaped thinking about Blackness since it first appeared nearly 400 years ago. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kim Hall. Robert, thanks so much for that beautiful introduction. Um, and I wanna thank you and the staff of the Humanities Center for this incredible series. It's been really energizing and beautiful to, look, to participate in and to, for you to invite me to be part of it. And to the audience, I am so sorry I can't see you out there, but I am wishing everyone here in this virtual space as much health, community, and happiness as our present conditions allow. So as Robert said, for most of my career, I have worked on race in early modern studies, which is to say from the 15th to the 17th century. So Othello was my grandfather is a bit of a departure for me. Um, the project uses Othello, the play and the character to understand the relationship between black Shakespeare study and performance and black freedom struggle. And so I'm going to just be a little transparent and I because I think there's some graduate students out in the audience. So when you write a proposal for a book, um, you offer, you know, you offer a kind of hopefully finely honed uh, project with a with an arc, a narrative arc and a, and a claim. And I had a claim and I had a narrative arc and I offered to uh, various institutions, including the Schomburg and Humanities Center, a project focusing on an already substantial corpus of Black Othello appropriations. And I approached these performances and related archival materials with a fundamental question. How can they help us create a Shakespeare? that is not a tool of white supremacy and settler colonialism. And so the book I propose is fundamentally about the appropriation of Shakespeare's Othello by black writers and artists transnationally. And even though it was for me a giant leap into the 20th century, which I'm not entirely comfortable with, I am at heart a close reader. So I'm hoping those skills have carried me through. But what emerged um, from my time in the Schomburg and from the enormous help of the library staff at the National Humanities Center, best people on the planet, um, was a vast world of Shakespeare illusion, citation, and play lurking in Black performances, historical records, 
artworks and canonical African-American African text. And these are kind of unfinished and small stories and unfinishable stories in some ways that defy the standard organization of books as I know them, right? And so much of what I'm interested in now are things that are even more ineffable than Black Shakespeare performance. Intimate encounters with Shakespeare text, moments of conviviality and community adjacent to the performance itself. So now I'm thinking about, even though there is a book at the heart of this, I'm also thinking about Othello was my grandfather as a series of interventions, a book, and now I'm thinking about a podcast series. So I'm just putting that out there in the world and hoping the universe, you know, tells me what to do. And I also want to say that this entire project has been a way for me to recuperate my own love of Shakespeare. A love ironically eroded in the course of performing as a professional Shakespearean at elite institutions for two decades. A love of Shakespeare is the connective tissue of much Black freedom activism in the 19th and 20th centuries and helped build networks of resistance to white supremacy and colonialism across the globe. So now I'm going to pull up this PowerPoint. Um, and let's see, I should not share screen first, but let's see. Okay, so and pull up the PowerPoint and drop other things. So, so in the past five years, there's been you know, a renaissance in the study of race in Shakespeare. More and more scholars have been trying to think about the conundrum of teaching Shakespeare within what Joyce King calls an emancipatory pedagogy, when we know that he is often used as an arm of white supremacy. And I began this project with a proposition that will seem obvious to many and perhaps needlessly contentious to others. People of color, but particularly black people, are not free to love Shakespeare. Our relationship to Shakespeare is frequently managed, I dare say policed, both by those who love him and those who see him as an agent of cultural domination. And in these times, particularly this summer, it would be understandable for any of you to ask, what does my free love or your free love of Shakespeare matter? Why care about the suspicion that greets blackness in the world of Shakespeare when people of color every day walk out of their homes in this free country to face suspicion and potential violence? And I, but I don't think we can liberate Shakespeare or ourselves until we understand Shakespeare's role of, in racial formation in this country and the resultantly profound relationship between Shakespeare and black freedom. I am suggesting today, uh, and I wanna find my timer while I suggest this. Sorry. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm suggesting today that dismantling some of our long held, oh, I'm so sorry, um, our long held, uh, Shibboleths, or something in this paper, sorry. I'm suggesting today that dismantling some of our long held shibboleths about Shakespeare, being less suspicious of perceived challenges to Shakespeare and forging a new relationship between Shakespeare and blackness are essential to having the Shakespeare usable for the 21st century. So, you know, um, after my time at the NHC and before the pandemic, I was in the process of traveling to Black archives, uncovering the place of Shakespeare for Black performers, intellectual and activists who speak their freedom dreams. And the ability to perform Shakespeare as the plays were meant to be performed on a stage in public with a group of actors representing the heights and depths of the human condition is a key image of freedom for Blacks almost since the founding of this country. No, oh, wait, what's going on here? Sorry. And I am inspired by Black feminist Bell Hooks, who in her book, Yearning, argues that speaking our yearnings might be the beginning of some sort of coalition for change. And she says, I thought of our passionate collective longing for peace and justice. Thinking that our yearning might serve as a uniting force, I wanted to make the longing of our hearts tied to the quest for freedom. And I should say in these slides, there, there'll be a lot more in the slides. They're not just a reflection of by what I say, but they're a little bit more interactive. So I've tried to give you a little bit of time to, you know, time to spend with them as we go through. So um, most of my academic life has been spent, as Robert you know, noted, in two worlds. The world of Renaissance and Shakespeare studies to which certain values are attached. Genius, universality, transcendence, and timeliness. And the world of Black cultural production more associated with emotion, embodiment, particular forms of genius, but also with trouble and disruption. 
Thus, for over 20 years, I have lived in the heart of conical knowledge in the US and, it's, and at its most influential margins. I see almost daily the complicated differences between the authority allowed or denied to uh, uh, BIPOC people, uh, so that's black indigenous people of color, even over our own experiences and the authority and value attributed to white cultural artifacts, often without scrutiny. I began my career during the early phase of the culture wars in the 1990s, when many scholars concerned with race, Shakespeare and cultural politics pushed the academy to question what forms of exclusion scholars enact when they insist on a transcendent, transcendent ahistorical Shakespeare, who is, as Peter Erickson says, universal, a fixed changing, unchanging point that was untouchable and unquestionable. One consequence of this insistence on universality is that Shakespeare was, and continues to be for many, a refuge from race. This Shakespeare was seen as needing protection, particularly from the disruptive hard questions that politically conscious blackness continually presses on dominant culture and an insistence that, and, and insistence that BIPOC lives be given a place in our classroom and curriculum. Sorry, that was supposed to be early. Um, Othello, oops, sorry, okay, let me go back. Othello has a particular relationship to African-American history in the black diaspora. At the moment, I have um, 70 and counting artworks ranging from poetry to drama to visual arts and comedy that all attest to his hold on black culture. As the 1995 play, The Moore's Fortune claims, we have wallowed in the ocean of Othello's legacy. Um, this talk has three sections um, that focus on Shakespeare and race from the 18th to the 21st centuries. Um, the, my initial evidence suggests that my own experience has many precedents. Much in this combined history of sh blackness and Shakespeare makes claiming three things at once, a black identity, a desire for freedom, and an appreciation of Shakespeare's plays, a more formidable task than one might imagine. So, part one, coming to you from my two worlds, I can't focus on Shakespeare's influence on the past 400 years without thinking about the 400 years of black history with which he is deeply intertwined. In these years, albeit in fits and starts, Shakespeare has grown in value as a cultural commodity, which is to say he remains a way to identify other objects of value. For example, in order to convey the personal presence and stature of already Pulitzer Prize winning uh, Toni Morrison, the New York Times notes, Morrison wears her age like an Elizabethan regent or a descendant of Othello via Lorraine, Ohio, straining to imagine her as somehow related to Shakespeare and to Othello who notoriously had no children. In those same 400 years, Blacks dispersed from Africa and the New World be also became a source of value, but as literal commodities, wooden chains to different sites of the New World and as, and as ideological property, our Blackness used, particularly on the stage, as the means by which masses of Americans could establish a positive and superior sense of identity. Like Othello, we have done the state some service. And in that dual history, the universal Shakespeare has served the same purpose as many representations of Black people, to maintain a sense of mastery and superiority for one group over another. Early in Othello, the villain Iago describes himself using the enigmatic phrase, I am not what I am. And frequently in popular arenas, Shakespeare is not who he is or was. And so when you hear the word, word Shakespeare in the media, in your classroom, it might mean several things. And I've tried to break these down into four elements. Shakespeare one, the historical person, a playwright entrepreneur who drew upon the energies of his day and the newly hatching theatrical culture of Elizabethan England to create incredible plays. Shakespeare II, the texts that come to us from that era that were the product of Shakespeare's energetic collaborations and competition with actors and fellow writers. Shakespeare III, the accumulated baggage of 400 years of cultural conversation and scholarship that trains us in ways subtle or not how to think and speak about Shakespeare. And Shakespeare IV, Shakespeare is a metaphor for Englishness or white European culture. These first two Shakespeare's are quirky, brilliant, boisterous, ribald, and beautiful. 
The last two are to be spoken of in hushed tones as if the stage was a cathedral rather than an entertainment space on the fringes of London often shared with bear baiting and his text, Holy Writ. In this latter sense, performing Shakespeare can be an empowering point of entry into theater and into Amer Anglo-American society more generally. However, laying claim to this Shakespeare can also reinforce the authority of dominant culture. It can stabilize or assert the power and value of whiteness rather than allowing space for new formation. So whenever you hear the phrase black Shakespeare, which you will many times this evening, I want you to see it like this. Imagine that small space between Black and Shakespeare as that 400 years of a history that largely denied Blacks access to the structures, particularly education and the stage that generally shape contemporary relations to Shakespeare. The slash represents that wounded past and division. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what W.B. Du Bois famously called the color line, which he identified as the problem of the 20th century and which continued, continues into the 21st despite that brief honeymoon after Obama's first election when the folks were colorblind. Um, so while it has been a mainstay of American Shakespeare, that appreciation of the bard is the path to greater acceptance and participation in dominant culture, it turns out that the price of inclusion too often is a belief in a false universality based on Western ideals and an amnesia to settler colonialism, enslavement, exclusion acts, and other atrocities. Our relations to Shakespeare both are part of and represent a larger struggle for black freedom, not the freedom to be included and tolerated in white institutions on their terms, but the freedom in a democracy to have institutions that nourish and represent the diversity of our societies. Unsurprisingly, black writers often grapple with questions of authority and universality using evocations of Shakespeare. And here we have playwright Alice Childress, who I found in the, who is widely known, but I found her a fellow at, unstaged a fellow adaptation, which had been commissioned by NBC, um, which was you know part of the the book book. Um, so Childress unsparingly notes the many markers of value in the literary world that are ways of upholding whiteness while devaluing black experience. And she says the marketplace is white. And there we are daily reminded that our writing is not considered universal. We are told the best is the subject matter applicable to the whites of the world. For black writers, especially those like Childress who wanted to make the struggles and glories of everyday black folk the subject of her art, genius and universality are shorthand for exclusion. Black attention to that 400 years is dismissed as too personal and too individual to move into the realm of genius, which is primarily reserved for white male experience. Childress notes that this is a one-sided conversation. Blacks are routinely expected to muster empathy for others, even if they lived 400 or more years ago, and yet are told our experiences are not relevant unless taken out of historical context and made palatable, palatable to the uninformed. The effort put into understanding historical lives is not given to black, writer, black writers. In a more, hope, more hopeful vein, W.E.B. Du Bois gives us a vision of black intellectual life beyond what he called the veil of double consciousness. I sit with Shakespeare and he winces not. Across the color line I move arm in arm with Balzac and Dumas, where smiling men and welcoming women glide in gilded halls. From out the caves of evening that swing between the strong limbed earth and the tracery of the stars, I summon Aristotle and Aurelius and what soul I will. And they all come graciously with no scorn nor condescension. So wed with truth, I dwell above the veil. In his now famous phrase, I sit with Shakespeare and he winces not, Du Bois offers a powerful vision of the future, a vision in which educated Blacks and the writers who embody our rich cultural heritage mingle on equal footing and without restraint, blending in with the long acknowledged arbiters of history, philosophy, and literature. Shakespeare's wince, a metaphor for the ways in which Shakespeare and Anglo-American culture have been used to belittle and stifle Black creativity, is replaced with quiet acceptance. So, um, let's see. So no Shakespeare play embodies black struggles over authority and inclusion more than Othello. The play seemingly offers a place of entry. Who better than black Americans to understand the constant sense of judgment, the suspicion that accompanies being an outsider? Who better to feel the story of a black man with a singular relationship to the state 
whose gifts of eloquence and military experience let him temporarily cross the boundaries of an insular world. Othello's desire to have you hear an unmediated story, to have others, in his words, speak of me as I am in the aftermath of tragedy, is a paradoxically powerful cry for peoples who are too often spoken for and about by others. And in this particular summer, I should mention this cry is particularly uh, poignant uh, when we have Blacks who are murdered right, you know, seemingly before our very eyes. However, the sense of kinship and understanding for Othello is vexed, both because of the story and the play's stage history. The Othello of Act One is indeed noble and eloquent. However, he is also painfully naive, and of course, he is the murderer of an innocent woman. More imp most important um, to talk about the stage history of Othello is to talk about the staging of blackness across the globe and to be always aware of the historical relationship between performance and black denigration. The first documented performances in the New World by transplanted Africans were co-optations of music and movement on slave ships and then on um, plantations to shape African bodies for plantation labor. America's best known contribution to popular performance history is blackface minstrelsy, where whites were trained to see black bodies only as a source of ridicule. So to claim or to reject Othello as Childress and Du Bois do is to immerse oneself in a history of race and black stigmatization. So, um, so now I'm gonna go to my title. Othello was my grandfather. I drew my title and inspiration from this W.E.B. Du Bois quote because genealogy is a key me means by which African-American writers and critical race theorists explain the workings of race. And Du Bois's family suggests the complicated ways in which Blacks inhabit Othello. In Dusk of Dawn, an essay towards the autobiography of a race concept, he reminds his reader that it is not his white ancestors who he says were quite lost and indeed unknown, but the Black Burkharts who set up the parameters of his existence. Quote, I was brought up with the Burkhart clan and this fact determined my life and race. Du Bois's family tree suggests that a century before he struggled with theorizing American racism, his ancestors had their own encounters with Shakespeare and a complicated picture emerges. Othello was a name given mockingly to the properties of slave society. For example, here's a partial list of enslaving voyages by the ship Othello. Jill Lepore's New York burning places an enslaved man named Othello at the center of the New York conspiracy of 17... 41, also known as the Negro Plot. A series of arsons in Lower Manhattan, um, which might have just been fires as well, but uh, presumed to be set by a mixed group of enslaved blacks and lower class whites, led to rumors of a citywide attempt to burn the island and kill all white people. Governing authorities resorted to a massive interrogation of enslaved men in its virulence equated to the Salem witch trials, even by contemporaries in other colonies. This Othello might have been the six-year-old Negro boy, Othello on the right, I hope, of your screen, um, auctioned off from the New York governor, John Montgomery's estate, listed in the same property inventory as Montgomery's The Complete Works of Shakespeare. Despite unreliable evidence of his involvement and the testimony to his good character by whites, Othello's pardon requested by his politically power ma powerful master was refused. Instead, his sentence was reduced to hanging rather than burning at the stake. On July 18th, 1741, he was executed along with 33 other black men and four white women and men who were burned or hung. It is not surprising to find a fellow amongst the ranks of enslaved black men. Elevated, grandiose sounding names from literature and classical history like Cato, Pompey and Caesar were a recurring, recurring joke for enslavers in the US, England and the colonies, a way of reinforcing, reinforcing white mastery literally every time they addressed an enslaved man. However, this history and Othello's character's paradoxical status makes Othello a strange choice for a name for a free people, or at least I thought it was. I'm, I'm, re, I'm th rethinking that every day. But this is especially true for the Burkharts, who paid careful attention to family names and family history. Du Bois's great-grandmother reputedly refused to take her husband's slave name in favor of her chosen name, Freeman. 
So what does this name of fellow mean for them? On one hand, the name of fellow might indelibly mark the trueness of Afro diasporic experience that Du Bois would explore in later centuries, the family's marginal marginality in liminal place in American history. On the other hand, the name might claim the family's sense of centrality to a story of Western culture. A fellow here moves from being fictive to actual kin, black property through kinship, not slavery. And there is of course a third possibility. Living in neighboring Massachusetts, it is very likely that this widely publicized case reached the, the ears of Othello's father, the formerly enslaved Tom Burkhardt, that he knew the story of the New York conspiracy and the wronged Othello better than he knew the plague Othello. Um, and so thus the name becomes a marker of someone who resisted and who lost. Du Bois makes the historical fact of his grandfather's name assigned to readers of the complicated legacies of blackness in the US, that race shapes your race, your birth and circumstances, and that grappling with our loss and indeed unknown history is a necessary task for survival. Um, so, oh, I missed it. So, Ordinarily, this would be a part of the talk when I offer a reading of a, one of the Black uh, Othello rewritings that I've collected. Um, but this summer in particular, the questions, question of Shakespeare's relevance is made inescapable for many as Black and brown murder and white rage circulate seemingly endlessly in our phones and our news feeds. The cries for justice for Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Armored Aubrey, and so many others appear under the banner of Black Lives Matter almost daily. Our collective anger, but also our collective yearnings have been made manifest in demonstrations across the globe. This desire to make our lives and work have relevance to this moment is, was made very clear in the New York Public Theater's recent Shakespeare on the Radio broadcast. The public, which had planned to, planned to stage a BIPOC Senate Richard II as part of its famed Shakespeare in the Park performances, was now called upon to face the challenges of performing in a pandemic, but concerns from actors like Sean uh, Carvajal, who said, you know, it didn't make sense to perform this, uh, to do this performance when our country was burning down. This tension is noted in the framing of each episode all dedicated to George Floyd in the Black Lives Matter movement. And so I think my last Othello stories, which in fact has multiple levels, and it's some, a story I keep coming back to, and I'm sure there are people out in the audience already annoyed with me already, but for keep coming back to it. But I think it will resonate very powerfully today. And I hope you will carry it with you as a way to help us think more capaciously about Shakespeare and how we use Shakespeare in our current moment. On a warm day in Minneapolis, black activists, citizens, politicians, and ministers gathered at the labor, labor temple for a national day of prayer, hoping to turn the nation's attention to white supremacist violence while the media turned its eyes to the upcoming presidential nominating conventions. The year was 1892, and that spring had been a heady time for Minnesotans having won the honor of hosting the Republican National Convention over major cities like San Francisco, Detroit, and New York, they were excited to burnish the city and show off its luster to the influx of important visitors who came in days and even weeks before the convention. And black Minnesotans shared this excitement. The Twin Cities have had a small but thriving and entrepreneurial black community. 1892 would be the height of black lynchings in the South. 161 documented murders that year. And so this May 31st day of prayer was the beginning of a period of activism. As the convention approached, many came to the city intent on using the convention to force attention to quote, the unpunished butchery of citizens. The Appeal, one of the city's black newspapers published this Thomas Nast cartoon on its front page on June 4th, the day the convention delegates were beginning to arrive. It took up the entire front page, I should say. If you haven't already seen it, in addition to the lynch rope in the bottom of the left-hand corner, the symbol of white supremacist violence and black subjugation is the bended knee of the white man on the black man's body. 
giving glancing notice to these concerns about racial justice. The city's white newspapers focused more attention on the expected showdown over President Harrison's nomination and the arrival of political celebrities at the West, the main convention hotel. Few discussed the refusal to seat a mixed black white delegation from the South, which I see as a harbinger, harbinger of Fannie Lou Hamer's attempts to be seated at the 1964 Democratic Convention. They did, however, cover the presence of Frederick Douglass, by now a distinguished elder who had come to participate in the suffrage rally with Susan B. Anthony and to show support for anti-lynching, for these anti-lynching protests. The Minnesota Tribune reported somewhat patronizingly, for several hours he was surrounded by a great crowd eager to stroke the old man's head. After standing for an hour, he excused himself for greeting his friends while sitting, saying as he took his seat, I don't belong to the rising generation. Although, may, although the mainstream press no, located, locates Douglas, the old man of the movement at the center of white political action, a very different picture emerges in this moment from the unpublished autobiography of Shakespearean actor, Richard Barry Harrison. Born in Canada, oh, I'm gonna skip that. Born in Canada, the fourth son of fugitives from slavery, Harrison was an itinerant Shakespeare reader and actor who in the 20th century would become nationally famous for his sonorous voice and stirring presence as the Laud in the wildly popular 1930 Broadway musical, The Green Pastures. And here you see the pictures of his funeral in multiple services uh, um, across the uh, US. Errol Hill's Shakespeare and Sable evocatively concludes his discussion of Harold Harrison's career suggesting the huge benefit, uh, the huge impediments the Shakespeare stage holds for black actors. Richard B. Harrison was not allowed to play Shakespeare on Broadway. He died playing God. At the time of the convention, Harrison was an aspiring elocutionist, making a name for himself in churches and auditoriums across black America. And all the pictures I can find of him were him kind of in his elder fame. So I don't have any younger ones uh, to kind of juxtapose with how he and Douglas might have looked. Um, he recounts meeting Frederick Douglass in a hotel in St. Paul. In St. Paul, I met Frederick Douglass, who was attending the Republican National Convention. I was happy to be stopping at the same hotel with Mr. Douglass, the Hotel de Mink which I, Kim Hall will note, was owned by a black woman. He was especially interested in my work and told me it was his greatest ambition to be an actor. He wanted to play Othello. I wonder if the world was not robbed of possibly one of the greatest Othellos the world has seen. For fully a half an hour at a time on several days, he would recite to me scenes between the Moor and Iago. One day he asked me what I thought was the strongest word that Shakespeare had written in any of his plays and told me it was the word indeed by, by Iago. He introduced me in St. Paul at the African Methodist Church. When my program was finished, as a sort of postlude post to it, he remarked, I am willing to leave the dramatic future of my race to Richard B. Harrison. So I want you to hold on to this image of Frederick Douglass reciting Shakespeare to a Shakespearean actor for multiple days at a time while I talk, while I digress and talk a little bit about Douglas, Shakespeare and Othello. And I apologize to those of you who know Douglas's history and life intimately. Frederick Douglas, Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey was born on the Eastern shore of Maryland in February, 1818. The son of the enslaved Harriet ba Bailey and an, enslaved, and an an unnamed white father who was probably his enslaver. Against his enslaver's will, he was taught to read and found many other ways to increase his literacy over the years. After escaping slavery, he was able to marry legally Rosetta Sprott. Abolition and support for fug enslaved fugitives became the family business. Douglas' speaking skills brought him into great renown and their family house became an important way station on the Underground Railroad. He wrote the best-selling, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, oop, uh, sorry, um, an American slave to demonstrate, as he famously put it, you have seen how a man became a slave. You shall, shall see how a slave became a man. Traveling throughout the US and the UK, he became one of the nation's most powerful voices against human bondage, arguably the most influential civil and human rights advocate of the 19th century. As a speaker, he was so eloquent that rumors spread that he was only masquerading as a formerly enslaved man. 
like most great orators, Douglas do upon Shakespeare and other great writers in his lectures. But his black contemporaries argued that he had a special affinity for Shakespeare and hint that Shakespeare performance was a key part of his lifelong self-improvement. Dr. Charles Purvis's eulogy in describing Douglas's education suggests that he both read and performed Shakespeare in private. The study of Shakespeare was a pastime with him. Few amateurs could excel him in the delineation of his characters. He would have made an ideal Othello if he chose the stage as a profession. Salvini, and this is an Italian actor famous for his Othello, would have found in him a formidable rival. Douglas himself notes the high stakes of his oratory in ways that might enhance a reading of Othello's act two. He says, I never rise to speak before an American audience without something of the feeling that my failure or success will be, bring blame or benefit to my whole race. Douglas also showed clear affinities with actors throughout his life. He introduced Henrietta Vinton Davis, um, who worked for him for a year, the first black Shakespearean actress at her debut before mixed audience in Washington, DC. Um, and with Douglas's oratory is another picture of Davis um, and remarkable presence, his black contempor contemporaries unsurprisingly reached to Othello as a point of comparison. George Ruffin's original introduction to Douglas's final autobiography, The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, written by himself, directly and indirectly alludes to Othello as he appears before the Venetian Senate. Douglas's life has been a romance and a fragrance for the stage. I mean, to the age. There has been just enough mystery about his origin and escape from slavery to throw a charm about them. The pure life he has led and his spotless character are sweet by contrast to mere politicians and time-serving statesmen. It is well to contemplate one like him who had hairbreadth escapes. This description, I think, encapsulates much of what black audiences admired about Othello, which is what Shakespeare tells us Desdemona admired, his honor and valiant parts, his powerful speech telling of the sieges, battle, battle sieges fortunes that he passed. Not surprisingly, there are few documented references to Shakespeare in the first autobiography, but the life and times of Frederick Douglass contains a variety of Shakespeare allusions. He evokes the fellow at key moments of public judgment. For example, yeah, in explaining his involvement with the failing Freedmen's Bank, which was in disarray and became bankrupt after he was elected president, he conjures Othello asking the Venetian Senate to hear his, the story of his marriage. He promises to give a fair and unvarnished narration and says that he was brought into an endeavor that had a shiny facade but no money. I found that I had been placed there with the hope that by some drugs, some charm, some conjuration, or some mighty magic, I would bring it back alluding to Brabantio's charge uh, that he used witchcraft to seduce his wife. Campaigning against slavery was a calling, but it was also a career. And I don't get time, have time to talk about how Douglas's performances strategies actually had to compete with other forms of performances, um, including minstrel performances on the stage at that time. He was paid by abolitionist societies to travel the US and to use his life story to rouse support for ending slavery. However, in the life and times, he reveals the prof profound paradox of victory. For him, the driving passion of his life, the very thing he brought to end, brought enormous loss. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, no. um, and this is his description of the end of abolition, the abolitionist movement. I felt that I had reached the end of the noblest and best part of my life. My school was broken up, my church disbanded, and the beloved congregation dispersed, never to come together again. The anti-slavery platform had performed its work and my voice was no longer needed. A fellow's occupation was gone. The great happiness of meeting with my fellow workers was now to be among the things of memory. In listening, listing these necessary losses, Douglas heightens the sense of pathos by evoking Othello. And if you remember, when Iago's plan firmly takes root, Othello experiences this new and absorbing sense of Othello's infidelity as an utter destruction of his being. And I'm not gonna read the quote, but I'll leave it there. Um, Othello renders the loss of his vision of Desdemona as an extended farewell to everything that had given his life meaning. The passage suggests how tightly woven his wife's honor is with his own sense of self and that he is prepared to take an action 
that will destroy his own honor and turn him to oblivion. It's a profoundly emotional part of the play as Othello despairs arises, despair arises in the sympathetic audience, its own sense of despair at witnessing a tragedy that they cannot stop. And um, I'm gonna go back now to the Douglas Harrison meeting, but I also want to add that Du Bois in the, in the third installment of his autobiography also turns to Othello's occupations gone when he separates from the Niagara movement. And I see a similar kind of profound depth of emotion, which is otherwise very missing and as critics have noted in that, um, in that version. So that Othello gives um, a kind of effective, um, um, beauty to the let to a kind of description of you know the relationship between these activists and their their seemingly lost communities. So now to return to Douglas and Harrison in St. Paul, and you know uh, it's it's you know when you see something like this and you don't have any corroboration from other sources other than yes there was a convention yes there's a hotel to make it's kind of hard um, and I've been desperate to find something else that kind of confirms this meeting but it's the specificity of his description that has really beguiled me and that makes me uh, convinced of its veracity and so in particularly this line one day he asked me what I thought was the strongest word that Shakespeare had written in any of his plays and he told me it was the word indeed by Iago and so most often used by Iago, indeed occurs frequently in the play. One of the villain's techniques for turning conjured fancies into real fears. I suspect the moment Douglas refers to is act three, scene three, when Othello, Iago and Othello come to Cassio leaving his meeting with Desdemona. It is one of the most metadramatic moments in a very theatrical play. Iago uses indeed to say and, not, and yet not say that the meeting was licentious. It is, I think, a demanding moment where the actor must play Iago and Othello and Iago, performing and interpreting for the audience the changes in Othello's psyche, along with Othello's sense of Iago's demeanor, which belies his protestations of innocence. It perhaps uncannily parallels Douglas's earlier abolitionist performances, where he mimics both the Southern white enslaver as well and his dubious logic, as well as the enslaved man's uh, black man's reaction to that logic. Harrison drives home Douglas's love of theater, not simply with an image of Douglas performing Iago and Othello, but with a detailed discussion of the intricacies of the text. Douglas astutely discerns how an innocent word like indeed performed at key moments can become the poison that runs through Iago's, I mean Othello's veins. Like Douglas's eulogist, Harrison uses the tantalizing image of a possible playbill proclaiming Frederick Douglass as Othello to suggest the ways that white supremacy has robbed us of black excellence. It reverberates against Harrison's later, later inability to achieve greatness on the classical stage, not from lack of talent, but from race discrimination. And I note, should note here that he turned down multiple opportunities to pass as Mexican or some other kind of white adjacent, you know, seemingly white adjacent ethnic, ethnicity for the 19th century, because as you can see, he's a very fair skinned actor. The effects of this meeting on Harrison are palpable. Afterwards, he carried formal advertisements of his appearance, of his, his appearances with the tagline, I'm willing to leave the dramatic future of my race to Richard B. Harrison. Um, but apart from being able to mobilize Douglas's cultural capital, perhaps as Harrison faced the very real dangers of the itinerant stage traveling through Jim Crow America, and he um, describes some, some actual hair's breadth escapes, you know, in his journey as a, as a Shakespeare elocutionist. But perhaps during these dangers, he took heart in the memory of the most powerful human right, rights advocate of his time, celebrating the Shakespearean stage as an avenue of freedom. So, um, so Douglas's engagement with Shakespeare and Othello seems a key part of his movement from mere literacy to mastery over language. But I suspect as he became older, the story of the noble Othello, the aging general, an ex-enslaved an ex man, and veteran of many battles whose life stories and skills as a speaker facilitated his entries into white worlds. Um, grain, great, grain gator gained greater resonance for him. So too, his second and controversial marriage to Helen Pitts, a white suffragette and fellow abolitionist, um, might have evoked uncomfortable parallels. Douglas, most critics agree, was highly conscious of his position as the most scrutinized black figure in America. 
sorry. And so for Douglas, this for Douglas now, this meeting might have been no less important than for Harrison, but I think in more inchoate and effective ways. Media reports at the time suggested he was a feeling of age of effects and perhaps heart disease. However, the vigor recounted in Harrison's remembrance suggests that these moments in this black woman's hotel were sustaining and energizing. Each day he was taken away from the relentless demands of his fame, the burdens of hearing about and then bearing insistent and public witness to oppression and white supremacy. David Blight's recent biography ar argues that in the face of these requests and more, Douglas felt essentially helpless. Seeing this embodiment of a freedom dream, the son of fugitive slaves building a career as a Shakespearean might have provided a, glim provided a glimmer of hope in a time of despair. The common language of Shakespeare for these men provided moments of pleasure and to use current language, self-care. Celeste Marie Bernier, who I was uh, fortunate to meet at the Humanities Center, her work in the Douglas family archives suggests that Douglas had just suffered from bouts of depression, partly post-traumatic response to enslavement, and partly due to having to absorb the relentless requests to bear witness to black pain even after abolition. In such moments, he turned to art. For example, during a period of depression while in Edinburgh, uh, you know, in exile, he bought and taught himself the violin. And as an aside, I hope making visible these momentary, playful and sampled Shakespeare's and um, encounters with art in Black archives can we a legacy can be a legacy we offer, stu offer students, you know, as much about Shakespeare, but about the role of literature, performance and play in our daily survival, even as our schools increasingly remove those uh, aspects of learning uh, in public schools. So. Douglas defied and exceeded the expectations for great oratory in his day. However, the editors of the collected works of Frederick Douglass note that there is little evidence, quote, little evidence that Douglass read many of the popular 19th century guides to oratory. Instead, he derived his first rhetorical theories from the black preacher and the slave, enslaved storyteller. Douglass's apprentice as a speaker was in bondage. Harris's anecdote takes plate at the site of demands for justice. But we also need to imagine these two talented men, one beginning to achieve success, the other seeing the end of his career, using Othello to speak their shared yearnings for a stage and audiences open to their unique gifts. So too this encounter makes us imagine the sound of their Othello. What kind of Othello comes to life when the son of fugitives from slavery hears the most famous formerly enslaved man in the world tell of being taken by the insolent foe and sold into slavery, of my redemption thence, importance in my travels history. Douglas, I suggest what the spirit of the preacher, the enslaved storyteller and the freedman to Shakespeare's verse. This is the kind of Shakespeare that comes to life when BIPOC actors are allowed to bring their histories, their insights and their native accents to Shakespeare's verse as happened with the public's Richard II earlier this summer. I imagine that Douglas felt like something like veteran Shakespeare actor, John Douglas Thompson, who recounts that he came, came to the rehearsal charged with anger and rage in part because you know, he couldn't see how reading Shakespeare could be important in this moment you know, um, as a stage actor. Thompson recounts that he came to rehearsals charged with anger and rage, but found that immersing himself in both the text and the experience performing and rehearsing together, both centering and cathartic, quote, to use this Shakespeare, this play as a way to reinvest my humanity because I was really feeling quite despondent about things. And I looked to see myself reflected back to me. Obviously one can center oneself and explore the range of one's emotions across a range of literary texts. Audre Lorde, Gloria Anzaldúa, and Tazaki Shange have all carried me through moments of despair. But in a world of branding, trademarking, and endless copyright claims, Shakespeare is still one of our few open source common properties that we can rework and rehearse together. But more important, just as there has always been some version of a Black Lives Matter movement, whether you noticed it or not. There has always been a Shakespeare in the heart of black history. As I have suggested elsewhere, it was Shakespeare as a common text that cre helped create a diasporic community out of the differences between black activists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. But the Shakespeare that brought them together was not a borrowed Shakespeare. 
It was a Shakespeare marked with what Amiri Baraka calls that sweet black thing with music and accents from the many regions of Africa, Europe, the Caribbean and the US. This is what characterizes Shakespeare in the black diaspora is what Francesca Royster calls Shakespeare with a difference. And this is the Shakespeare that will carry us into the future. Now, a very short conclusion and a big favor I need from everybody in the audience. So, um, oh, let's see. To perform Shakespeare, to read and study Shakespeare should not feel like color, crossing the color line. And for that to happen, for people to love and enjoy Shakespeare freely, he needs to be freed from being white property. So too, black distrust of Shakespeare and Othello cannot be dismissed. It has to be accepted as the understandable product of that same 400 years that brought Shakespeare's greatness. Oh my, I don't know what happened to that. Um, so now that we're in the 21st century and seemingly in a moment of potential amid state violence and despair, I implore you to do some things. I need you to recognize how cavalierly we throw around Shakespeare's universality and how uni that universality reinforces whiteness. As we know from Alice Childress, this insistence on the universal places shackles on the writer's pen. It also places muzzles on our students' mouths. When anyone bemoans the, bemoans the lack of attention to Shakespeare, please ask them what they're doing to make opportunities for communities to experience BIPOC Shakespeare performances, to make literature and art in general more accessible and available instead of complaining about the inadequate job teachers are doing and our curricula are doing. And I know this is hard, particularly if you work in a Shakespeare institution, because Shakespeare University sell, universality sells. It brings in white donors, it brings in foundation money and other resources to Shakespeare industries. And so I know that what I'm asking is not an easy get. But suggesting what Shakespeare can do for BIPOC and other such formulations is part of a colonizing Shakespeare tradition and keeps us on the wrong side of the color line and keeps the color line in place. I hope that the black artists in my studies can offer a different path, which is to go back to that quirky, brilliant, boisterous, ribald and beautiful Shakespeare and the lively theatrical culture which, from which he emerged. It is not our access to Shakespeare and white institutions that mark our, marks our freedom. It is our ability to, ability to inhabit and use Shakespeare on our own terms, to work on these texts together, to offer him our love, but with our difference. So thank you. Sorry, I went a little over time. My apologies, Robert. And I'm going to stop. That was, the just, that was, that was just wonderful, Kim. Thank you so much for that yeah. incredibly powerful and very deeply layered presentation. We have lots of questions okay. uh, from our uh, viewers and listeners. Uh, we'll be able to get to a few of them, I hope. Um, one, uh, one person asked uh, you to talk a bit more about the historical reception of Othello's relationship with Desdemona as a mm. figure for interracial love and desire? So, oh, that's an excellent question. And um, so part, the part of the, react, the reception is a kind of disappearance of Othello from the dominant stage. And I apologies, because my apologies because it's late at night, but there is actually an excellent dissertation where um, the scholar refutes this idea that Othello was not on the stage, but performed on Southern stage, not just on the kind of big stages. So part of it is a kind of like, it's it's the Othello is the, is the, um, the the world of miscegenation that America is already that the, you know is are already concerned about slave you know in you know enslaving Americans concerned about so there's also this you know just don't show it don't talk about it but at the same time allusions to it in various um, text um, and then um, you know uh, black writers take it up kind of very forthrightly. Um, uh, uh, Jane Sears, Harlem Duet makes the kind of um, Othello's um, marrying uh, 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 the, the character Othello um, marrying a woman, Mona, um, kind of central to the abandonment of of, a, of Othello's first wife that he imagines. I'm sorry, I'm not saying it quite right. And um, the Moore's fortune imagines that the couple had actually had a child and that Othello's black family has to come rescue the child before the Venetians sell him into slavery. So that that 
idea of an interracial family becomes very productive for writers thinking about the different ways in which interracial, inter, you know, black, white interracial relationships, specifically black, male, white, female relationships tap into larger um, con um, obsessions about race and sex and gender in America and in other countries. So uh, picking up on that, do you see differences in how uh, African-American male uh, artists uh, adapt Shakespeare as opposed to female artists, African, black female artists? Um, yes, I, that's such a great question. I need to spend more time with it. I've been searching um, for more women's interventions in Othello. And so, so there's a question of Shakespeare, right? And then there's a question of Othello. And the Shakespeare corpus is um, somewhat problematic if you're a black woman, right? Because they're not, they're, they're not that many black women characters and they tend to be kind of fugitive presences like Othello's mother who gives him the handkerchief. Um, uh, you, know, you know, black women claim Cleopatra and I encourage people to look at Francesca Royster's beautiful book on that, on, on Cleopatra adaptation and rewriting in general. Um, but in these, these so I'm going to speak specifically with these appropriations of, of Shakespeare, of Othello. And um, I think they, you know, because they're not central to the Othello story, right, um, there is a little bit more freedom uh, to read, to just blow the story open. And I'm watching eagerly uh, Deborah Ann Bird's um, uh, uh, work on Othello, where she's uh, becoming Othello, where she's regendering Othello for herself. Um, Golda Rochevel's uh, performance as Othello at the Everyman Theater in Liverpool, I thought was very, very striking. And they played Othello and Desdemona as a lesbian couple. And at the Globe, at a um, panel, where uh, at the last question was to ask the, there was a panel of actors and actresses who, and, and actress who performed Othello and Othello, uh, and the, they were asked to perform some lines for the Othello. And Rouchevel was the only one who kind of jumped right into it and was ready to do it. And I, you know, I think that moment for me was very striking. I have not gotten to talk about it, but it feels like they know that um, they're different. I mean, they're just definitely different points of entry and that for black men, there are so many, as, as Robert kind of pointed out, so many layers to being a fellow, to performing a fellow, to being told how to perform a fellow as Keith Hamilton Cobb described brilliantly in American War. That, um, so I guess I would say that they, they, um, that they are kind of taking the text apart and remaking, they being black women, more than I see black men doing, although that is not to say black men aren't doing amazing work, but I just feel like they're, that they of necessity just have to kind of break open these plays and um, kind of um, hit Shakespeare to a more fundamental level than I think black men, because there are also more roles for men in Shakespeare um, than there are roles, roles for women, so. And I'm gonna attempt to conflate a couple of questions so we can get to sure. both of them. Uh, so, Du Bois, one questioner asks, uh, says that we need our Black Othellos. And another questioner is taken with a 2015 production by the Royal Shakespeare Company uh, that uh, he saw that cast a Black British actor as Othello and a Nigerian actor as Iago. Mm -hmm. yes. And the question uh, that comes out of both uh, questioners is, can you comment on exploring the racial dynamics in a performance with this kind of casting decision. And what does it mean in the context of Othello as my grandfather and uh, in terms of Douglas's identification? Mm, those are great questions. So yes, um, so the, I actually, yes, we, um, the 2015 Othello. So I'm gonna just throw out some thoughts and they're not entirely in Koei. And I think Ayanna Thompson has much more uh, uh, brilliant answers to these questions of black Shakespeare performance than I do. Um, and she is in fact called, you know, talked, suggested we have a moratorium in performing Shakespeare's toxic plays because what happens is that, and this, you know, black, uh, you know, directors come to the play and theater companies saying they're going, they're going to get this play right. They're going to do it right. And then, you know, eh, what is it that you're doing to this play that has some kind of really fundamental toxicity at the heart of it, um, especially Merchant and Othello and Taming. Um, and so, you know, I think one thing theater audiences can do or, or managers can do, and I, 
directors, I can understand that this adds another layer of complication, right, to an already complex world where you're thinking about, and I've seen some directors on Twitter posting their thoughts about how they can detoxify a fellow because the you know actors are increasingly finding these metaphors too racist and they don't want to imbibe them while they're performing, right? Um, and uh, but there's also this question of the audience. And I think very often because of the nature of a subscription audience, the audience is perceived to be white and the kind of sense of, and the, they play to those sensibilities. And, and I think making visible BIPOC reactions to some of the things that happen might be a useful exercise for um, people who participate in the Shakespeare stage. For example, that scene of torture with Iago and Othello was, perhaps the most, one of the most, um, I, uh, um, just, I can't, it, it was like a dagger in my soul. And I, and so in those moments, I wonder is, are other people in the audience, are they, is that distance collapsed for them the way it's collapsed for me because of, you know, this scene of kind of black man or man violence that, that I've been trained to see as kind of part of black nature, right? And, I, and so I wonder about whether it, it kind of, it performs a, a kind of racist imagery for white audiences while it, for me it's performing just the kind of horrific kind of opposite of, of self-love in the diaspora that you can imagine. So I'm, I'm rambling, but I just, I think they're all, you know, kind of, um, uh, um, really important kind of um, points of entry into how we think about Shakespearean performance. And I think Douglas would have been extremely key on these. As I'm reading more, more about him, you know, Scott, it's just abundantly clear that he is entirely um, conscious of every aspect of his um, speeches as performance, of his impact on the audience, of the ways he can sway audience sympathies, of the other, as I mentioned in talking, other types of performance that audiences would bring, particularly minstrelsy. So when he's performing a black enslaved man, he's got to be super careful to not feel like he's jumping into um, this um, this world of minstrelsy. So I think he would have been he would have been an ex in addition to being an excellent actor, he would have been an excellent director and a manager of his own stage. So there you go. Or maybe Rosetta would have been an excellent manager of a stage. So I'm going to try to slip in one more question in the time sure. that we have, and uh, that is, can you talk to your to our audience a bit about where non-scholars can learn about, about Black people in Shakespeare's time and about uh, the history of Black Shakespeare performance? So, okay. Um, uh, Luckily, thanks to Black Twitter activism or Shake Race activism, there um, there's a, a, a book coming out in paperback by Imtiaz Habib called Black Lives in the English Archives. You know, it's a more scholarly book and a more difficult slide, but it, it offers so much. And I think if you are a, um, someone who wants to write stories about Black people in Elizabethan England, he gives you a lot of fodder for imagination. For Black Shakespeare performance, um, Arrow Hill's Shakespeare and Sable is beautifully readable. It is full of um, stories of black actors, each one of which could be a play in itself. I'm dying for someone to write. There, there actually have been already two people written plays about Henrietta Vinton Davis that are not published. But um, so, so there's that. Um, you can also, if you're on Twitter, I'm not on Facebook, but we have a, a hashtag, hashtag shake race, one word. Um, and if you're on Twitter, you know that, but um, there's a lively conversation and non-scholars are uh, absolutely invited into it. We've been talking about all of these events that have been going on this, this month, both uh, lectures and performances. And there are a number of, a number of talks that are geared to a better general audience um, brought by the Arizona Center for Medieval Renaissance Studies. And so if you follow the hashtag, you will see endless notices of them. So there's lots to do. If you happen to be in a public library, which obviously during a pandemic, you might not be. I encourage you just pick up a chronically Black America or any kind of Black history database, type in Othello, type in Romeo, type in an unusual name, and you will just get all kinds of just very, very interesting things that, um, that will lead you away from your book. <laughs> so. Well, 
unfortunately, we're out of time. We have a lot of other questions. Uh, I wish we could have gotten to, oh. but uh, I want to thank you for just a wonderful presentation. And I also uh, want to thank you for the plea that you made at the end of your presentation. Yes, humanity. Uh, go ahead. I said, yes, humanities. We need to support the humanities. If you want to save Shakespeare, you have to save the humanities. Well, thank you, Kim. Thanks to everyone who joined us tonight. Uh, this event has been recorded and will be available here on the National Humanities Center's YouTube channel. Please click, click the follow button and the notified bell below this video to be notified of future discussions and other videos from the Center. Finally, please join us next Wednesday evening at 7 Eastern Time when our guest will be Alexis Pauline Gums discussing her book, M Archive, which ponders how a researcher in the future might view our current moment of late capitalism, anti-Blackness, and environmental crisis. Good evening, everyone. Stay well. <laughs>